So tonight, our, our presentation is going to be this. We can't, see the, we can't see the woods for the trees. To save biodiversity, we must change our views on forests. Uh, Dr. Duran is an assistant professor at Rome University in the Department of Environmental Sciences and is a naturalist at Scotland Run County Park. He has uh, lectured on ecology and environmental issues and, uh, and concerns at the university level and uh, often gives presentations to the public, as tonight, on the importance of biodiversity. Uh, he's also the co-author of A Field Guide to Tiger Beetles of the United States and Canada. So please welcome Dr. Dan Duran, and you can't see the woods of the trees. Thank you so much, Rich. Um, I'm happy to put on my mask if people want me to do that. I figured since I was speaking, I could speak a little bit louder. I've been vaccinated. I've actually had a booster shot, too. Uh, but if anybody doesn't feel comfortable, I totally understand, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, but thanks for having me here again. I love coming here. Uh, it's, it's a great group of people. We're all interested in the same things. You know, we all care about biodiversity. And today, I'm going to talk to you about some interesting topics relating to forests, some things which may not be surprising, or maybe are surprising, uh, to the people in this room. So we'll see. succession and why that matters and again I'm assuming that there's a good chance that many of you have heard about succession we're going to get into a little bit more in detail uh, tonight we'll talk about the vital importance of early successional habitats which are often overlooked by the public and so even though again the people in this room may be a little bit more aware of that I think it's important to talk about uh, we'll go over some recent research on forest management and some really interesting things that we can learn there and then actually how to get involved directly because to me, if you're going to give a talk about something, it's not that useful if there's no way to take it home at the end and say, well, is there something that I could do to affect this? And so we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Okay, so in general, when people think of forest, I believe this is what they think of. You know, and I've done some research on this too, like Google searches and looking at putting in various search terms and seeing what comes up when you do this. And if you put in Forest. This is one of the top hits that you get. And it's classic, right? It's got these big trees. They're fairly widely spaced. It's dark. You know, in a lot of places there's shadows. Um, you know, this is, this is what I think people think of when they think of forest. This is not generally what people think of when they think of forest, for the most part, it appears. Uh, and so this is a young forest. And this is a forest that's extremely important. And we want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and so the first thing I want to do is explain to you what succession is. Again, for those who are not already familiar with it, and if you are, hopefully it will still be interesting when I show you some pretty pictures. So um, anyway, succession is simply the replacement of one ecological community by another one over time. And so what we're talking about is after some sort of a disturbance, whether it be fire or a storm or volcanoes, if you live in the part of the world where that happens, something could reset the clock where basically everything gets you know, burned to the ground, leveled to the ground by winds, whatever it is, and then there's a replacement with a new community that starts there. We can say a pioneer community of things that immediately get in there, or maybe we're already in the seed bank. Maybe we're already in the ground just waiting for this disturbance for them to start going. And so you're going to see um, shortly after this disturbance some annual plants, sometimes weedy things, sometimes invasives. Um, but a lot of early successional species are going to be small, quick growing things that are not going to live very long. They're not good competitors. They're good at getting there, but they're not going to last very long. After just a couple of years, they're going to start to get replaced by completely different plants, longer lived grasses, plants like things like milkweeds that might be, you know, longer lived perennials. And then ultimately that's going to turn into some shrubs. And we're going to see this sort of transition from an old field into a young forest. We'll get some trees. Certain trees start out really quickly. Things like eastern red cedars are really quick to get going. And then eventually they're going to get replaced by other things. And we'll get to the point where we have a closed canopy forest. All the trees pretty much touch. Uh, and there's not a lot of direct sunlight on the ground. And if you let that go and it's been like 150 years or more, then you might get to something that we would call a climax community. What's another word for climax community? Old growth. Old growth, exactly, right? So I think a lot of people are going to use that term. 
Um, and so that is what people tend to think of when they think of forest is the end, the very end. There's a whole process here and there's all these different stages. But it seems to me when people ask me about what I do, they're always surprised because they say, you say tiger beetles, so you must be in you know, these old growth forests. I'm like, no, there's no tiger beetles. No, there's a couple, but very, very, very few. And they're really surprised. Go, so wait, you don't go to the forest? Where do you go if you don't go to the forest? I'm like, well, there's a whole set of other things out there. Um, and so this is a picture in the Pine Barrens of a site that I hope we can win, win this battle. There's a war going on for heritage minerals. Um, it's an old abandoned titania mine, and it's got a thousand acres of sand dunes, inland sand dunes, which are fantastic and have all kinds of species that you only find right after succession starts because of fires and wind action and various things are keeping this open. And so you get things like sickle leaf gold master and various grasses, and it's going to be things that you're not going to see later on, but you might see if there's a, either an early successional stage or there's a continued um, sort of resetting of the clock. You know, if this goes on for a while, you can end up with things, you know, in a place that maybe, maybe we call an old field, where you get lots and lots of different kinds of wildflowers and grasses. You know, we have things like blazing stars here. Uh, various plants can, can really take over once you give them a few years. Um, ultimately, if nothing happens, this is going to end up turning into this old field stage where it's beginning to become the shrub young forest stage, where you can start to see some shrubs, and some little trees. Pines are always really early on. They come in quick. Um, you know, it doesn't take long. And if this is given enough time, it can progress to something that's more like this, where you're starting to really become a forest. But it is still a young forest. The trees are relatively small. Most of the trees are growing material rather than trunk. And so this is a very different stage than what's going to look like later. And given enough time, you end up with something that looks like this. Uh, this is probably about 75 to 100 years since it was abandoned as agriculture. Uh, and then it became this, this forest here, which is mostly oaks, although there are a couple of pines. There's one in the foreground. And uh, this, by the way, is very close to where I grew up. So this, this picture, I always look at this, and now I look at it now, and it doesn't look like this because they actually had a fire. And it's, it's really, um, really different looking after the fire, I can tell you that. And so the plant community is what we usually think about, but there is an animal community as well, and that follows the plant community. We're going to see that over time, the species of things like birds and mammals are going to change as the forest, as we go through forest succession. Um, and if you look at sort of all these different lines here, we can see some things uh, like our grasshopper sparrow, they only like those early successional stages. They do not, you'll never find them in a deep dark forest. Not going to happen. Uh, but things like a veery, they're only going to be in those late successional forests, right? And there's more lines that intersect in the sort of middle and earlier parts than there are later on because that's actually where most of the animals are. It's going to be in those mid successional stages. So, like I said, I, I, I find it interesting what people think. I'm not a psychologist, but I'm very interested in psychology. I'm very interested in sociology and how do people think about nature. And so, you know, when we think of nature, what do we visualize? This was one of the top things that came up when I put in the word nature into a Google search. And so, I mean, this is beautiful. It's crazy looking, right? I mean, it's one of those things where you can see, I get it. Like, I get why people think about this. Um, now, if you put in forest into a Google search, this is extremely revealing because all of these are late successional forests. None of these things are early successional forests. This is what people think about. And, and again, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying this is what it is. And so, um, but if that's what people think about, this affects what people think about conservation and biodiversity. And so it's important to know what people think in the first place. So really, when you come right down to it, we spend so much of our time focusing on the very end of succession. And as my former advisor, uh, Jamie Cromery, my professor when I was an undergrad at uh, Stockton University, as he said, you know, it's, maybe we shouldn't think of this as an end stage, it's just a stage, right? It doesn't have to end up at this last stage. Disturbances are natural, so things, you know, all of these are stages, and, and you shouldn't think of it as like this, like, goal, this, like, end product. It's not really necessarily an end product. In places like the uh, Flatwoods and the Florida Panhandle, it almost never gets to that stage. They have disturbance regimes of fires and lightning strikes are so common in this area that it's pretty much kept in an early successional stage. And most species there are adapted to that. They're not going to, you're not going to find a lot of things in these late successional stages. 
So a fantastic paper was written in the 60s uh, by Eugene Odom, a, a you know, really well-known ecologist amongst professionals, like really, really respected. And this is one of his most famous papers called The Strategy of Ecosystem Development. And he talks about a lot of different things in here, but one of the things he does focus on is we cannot possibly survive with only one stage of succession. And there's, we need all of these different successional stages in order for things to be able to work out. And he did all the math on this, actually all the ecosystem energetics and all these really complicated things. But the basic take home is, I like this here, this, this quote, the safest landscape to live in is one containing a variety of crops, forests, lakes, streams, roadsides, marshes, seashores, and waste places. I love that he said that. Um, uh, in other words, a mixture of communities of different ecological ages. And I love that he said waste places because most of the areas where I do research, people are like, that's nature? That's it? Because it's just a big field. It's just a big, and they don't think of that, right? They think of it as a waste place. That's what they think of. And I think it's unfortunate um, that, that we only seem to care about certain stages. And here's an extremely important point here, is that biodiversity is not evenly distributed throughout time and throughout successional stages. Biodiversity quickly goes up after a disturbance. And so you can see that here. I seem to have the laser. But anyway, um, you can see that here. It goes quickly up, and then it actually starts to, to go down. Um, and it doesn't take long before that starts to go down. Biomass, which is simply all of the stuff in the forest, all of the wood and the leaves, everything like that, that continues to go up. Biodiversity does not. And so if we try to map onto this our different successional stages, we can see that our field to our shrub young forest stage, right when things are starting to turn into a young forest, is about the highest diversity that we ever see. So it's not going to be your old growth forest. Now, I want to be really clear here. I'm not saying we should get rid of all old growth forests and only have young forests. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you're talking about maximizing biodiversity, you can't do better than a young forest. That's about as good as it gets. An old field and a young forest is about as good as it gets. And so in this talk, you're going to see a lot of pictures of plants, of insects, and of birds. And why have I chosen those three groups? Um, but I, now we get into all the pretty picture parts. Um, why have I chosen those? Well, plants and insects alone are 80% of all living things on this planet, or just those two groups. 80% out of 1.6 million species, about 1.3 million of them are just insects and plants. So that's kind of most of what's going on on planet Earth is insect-plant interactions. And birds are great because, well, we all love birds, right? We all know a lot about birds. And birds eat insects, so they're kind of the next level up. So that's kind of why we chose those types of things for a talk like this. And uh, so, you know, you go to an early successional habitat, you go to places that are open fields or open wet meadows, things that we could call savannas. There's all kinds of really neat things that grow in open, early successional, slightly wet to pretty wet habitats. We get things like... Um, our Carolina redroot here, beautiful plant, it looks kind of like a candelabra to me almost at times. Uh, we've got our soapboard gentians. I've got to see them in New Jersey in a couple places. They're not very common. There's not a lot of places left for them. Our tuberous uh, grass pink. We have all kinds of interesting orchids in New Jersey, especially in early successional habitats. We've got our white colic roots and other plants that are great for pollinators, especially things like our uh, butterfly weed, right? Butterfly milkweed or butterfly weed is a great plant, really attracts lots and lots of pollinators. Where do you find them? You don't find them in the forest, you find them in fields, especially dry hillsides, things like that. Um, and I study tiger beetles. This is my group that I study for a living. And if you want to find them, you're not going to find them generally in a late successional area. You're going to typically find them in the most early open successional habitats possible, like sand big sand piles and like dirt roads and areas that were fires just recently burned through. That's where you typically find them. Uh, here's a beautiful moth. A lot of times people see this and they think it's a butterfly, right? Because unfortunately people have this idea that moths are drab and butterflies are pretty. And it just, there's no reality to it. Some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen are some species of moths. Most butterflies look like dirt or leaves. You know, we, we think of a few of them like monarchs, and they kind of, you know, those are the ones we think of, but there's lots of beautiful moths out there, and uh, this is one of my favorite ones, a Promethea moth. Promethea moths typically are found kind of out in these open edge areas near, near more forested, but often in the open. We get birds like this uh, common yellow throat here that's going to be found, 
especially in areas where you have that sort of thicket shrub stage. You know, that's where you're going to find them. Now, kind of alluding to, to this one in the last couple of slides is edges, not just the habitats themselves, but edges, the areas of interface between different types of habitats are particularly uh, biodiverse and are going to have different communities than the adjacent successional areas. So uh, this is sort of a classic figure from a textbook, uh, but I like it. You know, you can look at this here, whoops, you can look at this here and you can see that um, if you have an area where you have, let's say, a forest and a field and they're right next to each other and it's just an abrupt edge, there's not a lot of transition, right? There's, well, there's basically no transition. But where you really get a ton of diversity is where there's this wide border where it's messy, where it's the large area of interchange that we could call an ecotone. So this here would be an abrupt edge. It can't be much more abrupt than this. It goes straight from deep, dark forest mm -hmm. to some sort of a field, and there's very, very little in the area that's sort of a transitional place. But this wider edge, this happens when you have this transitional area that over time you'll start to see things fill in right behind the forest. Air, things that maybe are shrubs that like to live where there's a little bit of shade, they don't want to be sunblasted all day, they don't want to also be in the dark. So they maybe have uh, different light requirements and they start to fill in and create their own structure and then behind them other things will fill in behind and you end up with this sort of really diverse ecotone area, this area of transition that you can find right there. Here's the spot in the Pine Barrens where um, I just remember seeing this beautiful ecotone of all kinds of things and we've got you know, our mountain laurels and there's sassafras and there's sheep laurels and all kinds of different things in this spot, uh, which you can see there as well. And at these edge habitats, you often have specialists that can only live in the edges. They don't live in either habitat. They only live on the edges, right? So that's an interesting thing. Uh, and there's, there's trees that, and shrubs that tend to be in those places. Um, we have our service berries, which often live in edges. Not always, but often live in edges. Bayberries often live in edges. And then we get insects that live in these places too, like this cobra spike tail here, which is a really cool uh, dragonfly that you can find, especially, you'll find them often in power line cuts, because power line cuts are like sometimes the greatest places to find rare things. It's really interesting because they're always right at that interface, and because they're often mowed on a regular schedule, they keep as if they were an early successional area right next to a forest. So you get this really cool uh, set of uh, flora and fauna. We have here is our eastern bluebird. Eastern bluebirds, as I'm sure everybody here knows, you typically find them at those forest field edges. You're not going to find them deep in the forest. You're not going to find them just in the middle of a the field. They're usually going to be on the edges. And one of my favorite birds are eastern kingbirds, which love to hang out the edges, often on power lines. It could be fences. could be barbed wire. Now, here's the interesting thing, is it turns out that even birds that like to live in the deep, dark forest, they actually need the edges too. They need the early successional and the edge areas as well as their deep dark forest. So this was a paper uh, in a journal called Forest Ecology and Management, and they said, do mature forest birds prefer early successional habitat during the post-fledgling period? This is an important time for them to be able to get food and grow. And what they found was that of seven of the nine species of birds that they looked at, which are all mature forest specialists, they preferred to be in places that weren't forests. They actually were going to be more likely to be found in clear cuts or natural openings, either man-made or wild openings. And so you can see here, for example, black burning and warbler. Um, that's showing you where they are in the forest, and they spend proportionally more of their time, as you go up, it's more of their time, in areas that are, again, either natural or man-made openings. Um, similarly, really, really dramatic red-eyed vireos. Red-eyed vireos really like to spend a lot of time hunting outside of the deep dark forest, right? So, you know, hopefully we're making a case here that the majority of biodiversity resides in early successional ecotone habitats, but what about rare things? What about things that are in danger? Well, it turns out that this is even more true of rare things. So the things that we're trying to keep from going extinct really need these early successional habitats, right? So here's a list of endangered plant species and plant species of concern in the state of New Jersey. And I've just taken one page of this and highlighted all of the ones that are found in early successional habitats and ecotones. Only a couple of species on this list are actually in, in mature forests. They're usually going to be things that live out in the open, which is, again, I think not what most people think. 
But on the numbers, this is clearly what it is. It's about 95% of our rare and endangered plants live in early successional habitats. Uh, if you look, now we don't have a list of rare and endangered insects for New Jersey that's very long because we, we don't have, we don't care about insects as much as we care about plants and birds. Um, so if we just look at this for the entire U.S., it's the same thing. The vast majority of these are going to be early successional specialists. Same thing for birds. Birds, it's, it's, you're just going to keep seeing this over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. um, here's an example of a rare plant that is found in early successional fire-prone areas. I'm sure somebody knows what this plant is. Anybody know? I'm very attention, absolutely, yeah. That, I took that with my iPhone 10. I sent you a bet, right, for an iPhone picture? <laughs> um, I was real happy about that one. No, but that, that's just, you know, it's a beautiful plant, and they, I've heard people say, wait a minute, so they don't die when you burn them? And like, no, 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 they like fire, but they don't like to be caught, set on fire. You know, they, they only live after there's been a fire, they move back in, right? So we've got our orange fringed orchid here. Uh, we've got things like this uh, Hessel's hair streak. Hessel's hair streak is a butterfly that is only found uh, on Atlantic white cedar, but specifically young stands of Atlantic white cedar will not live on mature Atlantic white cedar. So you have to have new growth, you have to have young trees, and they will come down and they will feed on sand myrtle and other things to nectar, get nectar, but when they actually, the caterpillars feed on the plants, they're gonna feed on young Atlantic white cedar. This is an interesting bird, right? I think we have, uh, all know what this bird is here, our, our bobwhite, right, which used to be wild in New Jersey. I remember hearing one mm -hmm. in the early 90s in Brigantine Wildlife Refuge, and that was the last time I heard one. Um, it's been a, been a little while now, and I know they've been reintroduced recently into New Jersey. Where, where have they been reintroduced? Does anybody know? I think Willabrator. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this is a species that's unfortunately uh, an ecotone and early successional habitat specialist that's really, really been hit hard by habitat loss um, and, and other things too, invasive species. And you know, I don't think coyotes go very well for them, but uh, this is a species that we've lost. Um, and succession is a form of habitat loss too. I mean, you don't, it sounds weird to say it like that, but it is, right? So the habitat that you have at any given time, if there's no reset of succession, then it goes away, you know, it goes away over time. Um, so something like this, it's not going to stay like that. And that's okay, but it's just to point out, that's not going to, if you do nothing, this will not stay like this. Over time, um, trees that are later successional trees are going to outcompete and take over and replace um, all of our early successional habitat trees, and then they, they won't be there. So there was a natural way that this would get reset periodically to keep that diversity, in the eastern part of North America, that would have been fire. Fire was a hugely important part. In the Pine Barrens, 60 to 100,000 100, acres a year would have burned historically in the Pine Barrens, but now we don't get anywhere close to that because there's houses everywhere. So it's very difficult to have fires and let them go. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer for that, but I'm just saying that's, that's the problem that we have now. Um, so fire naturally would have done a lot of this reset. Now, this is kind of interesting. Here's some images here. This is from a paper on biogeosciences. Uh, they're looking at the age of forest stands in different parts of North America. And as you can see here in New Jersey, um, right, we're right there. We're somewhere in the like 40 to 80 year range for most of our area. And it's actually really consistent. There's, it's all kind of that yellow color, right? You don't see a lot else. Almost all of our forests in New Jersey are like middle aged. Maybe some are the late middle aged, but they're for the most part middle aged. We don't have a lot of young forests, we don't have a lot of old growth forests. And this is showing you the variance in that age. And so basically the standard deviation, which means how much, you know, how much uh, vari variation is there in the age of a stand. And there's effectively none in the entire eastern United States. These numbers in the greens I mean, essentially every single tree is roughly the same age, right? There are exceptions, there, you can find individual trees, but for the most part, any stand of forest is very, very even aged. Whereas you get into parts of the north and the northwest, and there's tons of variation in the age of those trees, which is more naturally how it would have been historically prior to human interference. So, in the early 1900s, up to 60% of northeastern forests were shrublands and young forests. What do you think it is today? 
say in New Jersey? Housing developments. Uh, 15. 15%? 15 30, okay. 30. 30? Okay. Try 3. 3%. Oh, we have lost an incredible amount of young farms, right? We're down to 3 according to a 2019 survey by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. So, birds like this bird here, somebody knows what this is. Goldwyn Warbler, of course. I got to actually see one um, right next to me. I got to go with a uh, bird banding crew just this, pre this past spring. And it was really cool because I've never been close to one before. I've heard them, I've seen them, but I got to see one really up close. They wouldn't let me hold. <laughs> They're like, he might hurt it. I'm like, all right, I understand that argument. You know? But I wanted to hold it. Um, I would have been very, very careful. Uh, anyway, this is a gold-winged warbler, and this is a very rare bird now, and the reason they're rare is because of that 3% that we just mentioned. There's so little young forest left for them, and that's a young forest specialist. This is the kind of place where you would typically see a bird like the gold-winged warbler. Um, now, here's the thing, though. Any conservation measures that protect the gold-winged warbler are not just gold-winged warbler, right? This is going to protect thousands of other species as well because many, 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 many species of all kinds of things ranging from you know, New England cottontails to purple milkweeds, so all these different things are going to regularly use young forest as their either main or one of their primary habitats, right? So all of these things benefit when you do conservation measures for uh, gold water because I've heard people say, well, you know, should we just care about one species? This, this is not one species. This is thousands of species. Okay, so I uh, want to give you a little bit more about the importance of early, don't worry, we're not a quarter of the way through, it just, it's very front-loaded. <laughs> uh, so anyway, let's talk about the vital importance of early successional habitats, right? So I think we've established that most biodiversity is found in these early successional habitats, um, but you know, we can say, why do, why do you even care? Because sometimes I get asked that on a plane or at a family gathering or something, or someone's a distant relative, so why do you study biodiversity, why do you care? You know, kind of thing, and so, um, we could, if we care about putting it in human terms, what, what biodiversity is doing for us, we could refer to ecosystem services, right? The conditions and processes through which natural ecosystems and the species that make them up sustain and fulfill human life. So what is biodiversity doing for you lately? Most people care about themselves, <laughs> let's be honest, right? And so they want to know, why should I care? Well, here's why you should care, right? Uh, things like pollination, you know? Pollination is extremely important. It's worth incredible amounts of money for uh, agriculture and also, you know, you can eat. So there's that too. So I think whenever people talk about dollar values for ecosystem services, sometimes I'm like, and you're alive too. That's a really important thing because jobs and money doesn't mean anything if you're not alive. So there's, there's that, right? The vast majority of pollinators are found in old fields in these field forest ecotones and young forests. So when you're in a place like this old field, tons and tons and tons of pollinators, which can then go off and pollinate other things that we care about or that we eat, right? Again, here's the ecotone. There's a whole lot of uh, floral stuff going on here where you, you don't really see that when you get further into the forest. In fact, plants rely so heavily on pollinators that nearly 90% of plants need insects to be pollinated. Right? Some can be pollinated by the wind, right? about 8% of plants are pollinated by the wind, but nearly 90% of plants are pollinated by insects. And we could put a dollar value on this if we want to, because people really like that. And it's worth about $40 billion a year. So $40 billion a year is not nothing, right? That's a lot of money. Um, whenever we talk about pollinators, people want to ask me about honeybees, which I get. It gets old, but I understand, right? So it's like, well, European honeybees were introduced here. They're not actually doing as much pollination in some cases as we thought. Um, if you like honey, though, you're not getting honey from any native pollinators. You're only getting that from honeybees. So honeybees, you know, certainly have their role in everything. Uh, but a lot of pollination is done by our native pollinators, and I think we need to think about that a little bit more. The vast majority of those um, are going to be in these habitats we've just mentioned. Um, and then we have climate change mitigation. is another ecosystem service that we get from biodiversity, right? And uh, both young and old forests absorb significant amounts of carbon dioxide from the air. And um, I have a 126 slide talk, and when I gave this, I would say 90% of the questions that I got were based on the two slides I'm about to show you, even though that's not the main point of my talk, and it's just one little tiny, 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 tiny part of it. Um, so I'm gonna go off on that right now. Um, 
And I'm not going to get into the uh, war about which is more important for carbon sequestration, older young forests. I'm just pointing out the research, right? This is not my research. This was published in Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences, which is one of the most prestigious journals in the world. This is the highest quality science we have. And they found that young forests absorb about 25% more carbon than old forests. Again, not my opinion. This is just what's been published in high profile journals. And the reason why they found this is because there's more actively growing tissue in a young forest, and there's a lot of carbon that's sequestered, that's already been taken out of the air and sequestered, stored in old forests. But as far as active carbon removal from the air, apparently young forests are doing about 25% more. So now, in the end, they're both important, right? They're both important. Um, so let's talk about some recent research on forest management. So when I talk about forest management, let me explain what I am not talking about. This is not what I am talking about. I am not talking about deforestation. We're talking about ecologically based cutting of trees to mimic things like fire or windstorms. And we're not talking about taking trees and turning them into, uh, this is about to become a uh, oil palm plantation or housing developments. I don't think there's a lot of conservation biologists that are going to tell you that those are good things, right? So, and neither am I. What I am talking about here when we talk about forest management is places that end up looking like this, which is after selective tree removal, um, that there is often a regeneration of biodiversity, which is, in many cases, as we'll show you, actually higher than what was there before that was done. Again, mimicking the natural process of succession in an ecologically uh, sustainable way. So when people talk about trees, uh, there's different ways you can talk about you know, how that's happening. There's things like clear kind, which is just taking a whole bunch of trees out from one area at one time, contiguous, right? Uh, large clear cuts are generally not something that most people are a big fan of. Um, shelter wood, group selection, single tree selection are all ways of taking some trees but leaving many trees in the same area. So here's a study that was done in Tennessee where they were looking at bird diversity, which is also referred to as species richness. It's just the total number of species that you have. Um, and looking at this in forests of different treatments. And what they found was the, um, all of the different treatments of clear cut and various thinning methods had higher bird diversity than when there was no harvest at all. Right? And this is not isolated. This is what everybody finds every time they do these studies. There are literally thousands of studies that show this. Here's another study. This one was done in central Missouri. And they were looking at uh, pre and post harvest of, of bird diversity. And again, there's different uh, measures here. No harvest is the, the one with the triangles. Uh, we can see various types of things, including clear cuts and shelter trees and other types of forest, forestry. And in every case, the lowest diversity of birds was in the, the stand that did not have any management. So again, these are just the facts. Uh, now, one of the things I thought was interesting is I said, well, what is this going to do to late successional specialists? Things like a lot of moths actually only live in late successional habitats. So if we take out some areas and we create openings, is that going to hurt them? It might help a lot of biodiversity, but I'm curious if it's going to hurt those. And what was interesting was, uh, this is a paper um, from a few years ago on biological conservation. Um, that was not the case. It turns out that small alleyways through there, areas that are called rides, standard rides, because um, this was done in England, were not significantly different from woodlands that had not been altered at all. So you could actually get your early successional biodiversity come in without hurting your late successional diversity, provided it was done, again, in ways that were already studied to be uh, uh, sustainable. And even with rare species, there was not a significant difference. Not just other moths, but rare species in particular. So if you want to really know what's going on, there's something known as a meta-analysis, where you can look and say, OK, what, what are we finding the results of many different studies at once? And so this was a, uh, a meta-analysis called, can retention forestry help conserve biodiversity? And they looked at 78 studies concurrently, including almost 1,000 comparisons of biodiversity between these retention cuts, where you leave most of the trees, but you take some, um, and comparing those either to clear cuts, where you just take everything, or unharvested forests, where you don't do anything at all. Uh, and what they found was, um, here's one particular comparison of clear cuts versus 
some retention forestry. And some things actually did better, interestingly enough, um, plants generally did better in the clear cuts than they did in the retention forestry. Overall, things were a, a little, sorry, actually I got that backwards, sorry, sorry, this is saying that did better than the, the clear cuts. So actually plants did a little bit better in the areas that have been managed, and overall things did a little bit better in areas that have been managed compared to clear cuts. What's really interesting is compared to unharvested forests, there was still a tendency for things to generally be slightly more biodiverse when you actually did some forestry. So uh, what they found was retention cuts supported higher total species richness and greater levels of abundance compared with clear cuts. That's not super surprising, but there was also a positive effect of retention cuts of both total species richness and total species abundance compared to unharvested forests. So again, this is a study of almost a thousand comparisons here. Um, so, you know, what, what, can, what can we do? Is there anything that we can do? Most people don't have an entire forest, right? I, I'm well aware of that, right? Uh, but you can do things. There's a great website called the Young Forest Project where they actually give advice on how to maximize your biodiversity if you have any land at all that could, could be uh, managed. And that could involve things like uh, either against selective cuts or selective burns. Burns are great. If you can do burns, it's better than doing cuts, but most of the time, you know, that's a, that's a difficult thing to do. And I know in, you know, Winona or Mancho or whatever, you're not going to be doing a lot of controlled burns, probably. It's very, very difficult to do. Um, but, you know, an important thing that they point out is invasive species management is a really critical part of this, right? And we all know that that is a really important part. And there's, there's no way around it. You know, anything that you do is going to create an opportunity for invasive species to come in. Um, but that shouldn't stop us from trying to maximize biodiversity just because we're afraid of that challenge. So I think that, that you know, we, we can't just give up so, to avoid invasive species. So there's lots of information here on how to do this, depending on where you live. Um, and one thing that's, that's been said here too is, you know, if you are, if there were to be trees cut, and especially if they were cut left, to create woody debris for lots of wildlife, you want to try to leave some trees around places that are like vernal ponds because you don't want them to get too hot, right? So you want to keep some shade on those. Um, so there's different, again, there's different types of forestry management processes. It's really important to leave coarse woody debris if you are going to do anything with taking trees down because um, that's where so many species of fungi and mammals and birds are going to live in dead trees. And in fact, there are more species of birds that live in dead trees than live in live trees. So that's, that's a really interesting thing. Um, fire is great if you can pull it off, um, and managing invasive species is a really important part. Um, but you know, when you don't have a forest, you can do things to mimic a young forest, even in our yards, even if you have a quarter of an acre, or a half an acre, or whatever you might have. Um, you can add native shrubs and young trees to your landscape, which can increase that type of habitat in your general area. Um, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, <laughs> but why is it matter if the plant is native? Well, there are reasons why, and we'll give the quick answer, which is um, lots of things will be attracted to exotic plants, but they will not be able to very likely complete their entire life cycle on them because they don't have a long history with those plants. These particular species here are red admiral and our monarch butterfly. They have a long, many million year history of feeding on either um, our uh, Urtica dioica, uh, what's the common name for this right now? I can't think of it. No, I'm thinking now, like, you're like, this is a super easy common name. I can only think of the scientific name for some strange reason. Or milkweeds, right? Um, and they have a long history. They have millions of years of coevolution with those things. You can't just throw a new plant in there and say, feed on this. It takes millions of years to become evolved, to be able to learn how to recognize something as food. So with native plants, you're going to be able to support a lot more um, biodiversity. And here was a really cool paper that just came out last year. Um, in Nature Communications out of Doug Tallamy's lab, um, where they found that only a few species, only a few genera, sorry, a few genera of plants support 85% of butterflies and moths are supported by five genera of plants. Oaks were number one. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. Just, just these top five on here will support 85%. So I'm trying to pick things from that list, right? Um, so when I give you some, some examples of things that I think could be you know, really good additions to your yard. Um, so you, I look at something like this and I say, oh, my, there's such an opportunity here. This could be managed in a way to create valuable ecotone habitat. 
Um, you know, so you can do that yourself. If you have a yard, you can put some things in there. The following are some suggested plants based on suitability for caterpillars and their value to pollinators. They are all native or I wouldn't have put them on this list. Um, prairie willow is a great willow that you can get because a lot of our willows are either not ornamental, like black willow is awesome for wildlife, but nobody plants that on purpose. You know, it doesn't look that good. It just, or most people don't think it does, you know. And um, so this is a great one. It doesn't get giant. It's, it stays nice. You know, people, it, it, it does what people want it to do. Um, and it's a nice looking plant. American Pussy Willow, which is different from the ones that are often sold. This is Salix Discolor. Uh, it's going to be uh, another nice option for you if you want to go with the willow route. And here's a picture of a morning cloak butterfly that I took at Scotland Rump Park, um, which is a willow feeder. And there's another willow feeder. Beautiful one. Anybody know what that is? It's a cecropia moth. This is, a big, this is our biggest moth. By total wing area, this is the biggest moth that we have. And then we get things like this willow flycatcher. Uh, Blaine Rothhauser is an amazing photographer. I <laughs> just, uh, like how can you, you can count the hairs on his face. It's amazing. Um, Arrowwood viburnum is a great plant that creates an excellent sort of shrub to ecotone type layer. Um, it's got edible berries for birds. It's got pretty flowers for pollinators. It looks, I think it looks nice all seasons. It's, it's a great plant, can't go wrong with it. And then we have species of prunus, which are cherries and plums, that are often underutilized. And, and please don't get one of those ornamental, exotic, weird things that, I, I, I call them fake cherries, my father gets mad. He says, what do you mean fake? It's right there. I'm like, but it doesn't occur in nature. It's not, it's not a natural cherry. It's not, you know, we have cherries that, that, that are native to here. Prunus americana is a great one, right? Um, American plum. Awesome for pollinators that are out early in the spring. This is a great early season pollinator plant. Um, service berries. Service berries are awesome. Uh, unfortunately, they do get hit by a disease if they're close to eastern red cedars. They can often get this, uh, this cedar rust, cedar apple rust, which can transfer back between the two groups. And it doesn't kill them or anything, it just makes them, they don't look as nice. So, yeah, so basically, hopefully, I've made the point that. While there's this whole array of successional sages, and all of them are important, all of them are, maybe we should be spending more percentage of our time focusing on the ones that have the maximum amount of biodiversity, and that's not what we've done in the past. And so I just think that's an important thing. Hopefully you got that message. Um, and just real quick shout out to the Southeastern Grassland Initiative. Um, there used to be grasslands in this part of the country, people don't realize that, um, all the way up to parts of the southeast into the mid-Atlantic, and uh, lots and lots of diversity of flowering plants in those types of habitats. Uh, so I had some great photographs that were taken by various people. Uh, Jason Sepka is always my photographer. He just, I think a third of the pictures uh, in my talk were from him. He's amazing. Uh, Gift Beat is a fantastic photographer of birds. I used a few of his. Shaden, uh, Sharon Wade Wander uh, provides some great habitat pictures early on, uh, as did uh, Uli Larmer. Uh, and then a lot of great bird pictures from uh, Blaine Rothhauser and Steve Roman. Had a lot of good conversations with different people about this. And uh, when I originally gave this talk, it was to the New Jersey Native Plant Society. Uh, so I appreciated them giving me a venue for this. And then I appreciate you for coming to this version of the talk. So that's what I've got. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll just go right into it. Um, there's a lightning rod called Sparta Mountain, um, and this is an area in northwestern uh, New Jersey, and it's where they're doing a lot of the restoration for uh, Goldwing Warblers, and they're doing selective cuts there. And I, I've been to these cuts, I've seen it. I've seen the areas that have been five years ago cut, and they look fantastic. The diversity of insects was some of the highest I've ever seen in New Jersey. Uh, but a lot of people were upset because they said this was old growth. It wasn't. It's late middle aged, um, and you know said you shouldn't cut any trees. Well, ninety what was ninety two percent of it was not touched. 
Uh, 8% of it was only on the edges, was being managed. So nobody was ever saying to cut the whole thing. Um, but that was thrown around there a bunch of times. They're going to cut the whole thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's being done by New Jersey Audubon Society, who I think has a pretty good track record of caring about biodiversity, but a lot of people said that they were just, they're just in this to make money from forestry, but the numbers don't really support that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, when I gave this talk, all of my questions were about Sparta Mountain and carbon sequestration. That's all my questions were. I'm like, this was not a Sparta Mountain talk. <laughs> But unfortunately, it kind of turned into that. So, yeah. Any other questions? As the climate warms and we begin to lose trees and the ability of trees like maples and others to survive um, in areas where they're endemic, how long will it take for things to catch up and reforest? Uh, you're saying how long for things to reforest naturally? Yeah, because the the seeds won't be there anymore, or it won't be viable in the climates that now exist, and that's something that we're finding in the West Coast, um, particularly in the Sierra. Yeah. So I mean, what's going to happen is um, we're essentially 18,000 years ago. So 18,000 years ago, everything moved up hundreds to thousands of miles north from where it was because the glaciers melted back and things warmed up. So we're going to end up seeing, it's not that there won't be things, they're just going to be southern things. You know, we're going to end up with lot, like lots of things that are on the edge of the range right now or that already are here but will just become even more overrepresented like, you know, tulip tree and catalpa and things like that. They're just going to end up becoming more common probably. I mean, that's what it looks like is going to happen. And there, and there are people suggesting planting things like that now to sort of get ahead of the curve. I I have mixed feelings about that, but I understand the argument, you know? So I don't know, it's, it's a good question. Oh, I live down the street from a farm that's like your picture, sort of farm and then woods and marsh. I live in the swamp, but anyway, um, so, and, I, and you know, it makes me want the farmer to know this information. So they'll put in, what did, what did you call, an ecotone is like the edge, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so is there any um, organization or any way that farmers are being encouraged to put, put them in instead of, well, put the edges in, but also not have their entire farming uh, operation be monoculture? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's great, that's important stuff that you're talking about. Uh, there's an organization known as the Land Institute, um, and they have excellent information about this and all kinds of great suggestions. And there's good research that says it actually benefits farmers if they have strips of native habitat in there. Getting people to be aware of this information and then do something about it, because the most powerful force in all of nature is inertia. Changing something that you're used to doing is just the most difficult thing to do. Uh, and so, and because again, it's not even like you're asking someone to sacrifice. It, it comes out as a net positive, even for the farmers, but it's just, it's not what they're used to doing. So I guarantee there are people that would do it if they knew more about it. Um, but you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to get, to get that message out there. So, I mean, hopefully, one of my talks has reached someone who <laughs> you know might make uh, a that, different the decision. The Land Institute is doing some of that, or they're yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I think it's landinstitute.org. Okay. Um, it, it, just fantastic, fantastic stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, forty years ago, when I knew practically nothing about ecology. I planted an apple tree in my backyard, you know, hoping to have branches full of golden delicious. <laughs> and then uh, the following year, I noticed these um, juniper bushes just out in the field, nobody wanted. So I said, well, why should I pay for laurel and extensive 
tree, you know, these juniper trees like it would do the job. So over the year, I dug out about a dozen of them and put them down inside my driveway. Somebody says, your apple tree is never going to do any good. And it's not going to do the juniper or red cedar, as some people were calling it. It's not going to do, the apple tree is not going to do them any good either. Yeah. I went, oh. So recently, this last year, the apple tree got removed. This year, the juniper went hog wild producing flowers and berries. Oh yeah. Which um, is kind of a nuisance because the sparrows eat the, uh, <laughs> the berries. Yeah. And right next to where they are is the car. <laughs> <laughs> So it's not really a, a, a question sort of thing, it's more of a statement. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's an interesting experience that you had. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the same thing that uh, service berries have, is they have this pathogen that moves between them and the, and the eastern red cedars that you were talking about. And uh, I, unfortunately, I have this disease in my yard. I'm so excited because I got service berries, and I love service berries. They're delicious. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, all of them were covered. And I got a cultivar that was allegedly resistant to the disease, and it is not resistant to the disease because the first year it was in the ground, it's already got it. So I'm like, oh. Mm -hmm. So I was very disappointed. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions right there? Or? Just a comment about willows. Um, I don't know if this is true for all willows, but I know. Like, I can't put a willow in my yard, even though when it rains a lot, it's a lake. My yard is a lake, you know. Um, and I can't put a willow in to drink stuff because of the roots. They seek really aggressively uh, water, and they would go to the pipes, they would go to my neighbors, uh, you know. So, um, that makes me think that willows are in the same category as good fire. We can't have good fires anymore because of people, people's homes, and we can't put in willows where we might like to because of the roots. Well, these are really small willows, so uh, I, I suspect that I, I do not want to say I have tons of experience with you know sailors humorless or anything like that, but. Um, I don't think, and somebody, if they do have more experience than Carl, or, um, mm -hmm. I don't think they have as extensive root systems as, as mm -hmm. something like a, like a pussy willow, the European one, or, you know, a big willow, like, you know, weeping willow or something like that. Oh, okay. All right. That would be good. Yes? So did the tornado give us some early successional yeah. positives? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny because when I was... Driving around right after that happened, I mean, I'm not immediately thinking of that. I want you to understand, I was immediately thinking people first. But it, I started thinking, because there were a few places where you could see how it had opened it up. I'm like, there's going to be some things that are going to come in there, you know? I mean, but again, it's one of those things where that would have been a natural process, and now, you know, it's, it's, things are different than they used to be. Um, but yeah, probably we will get some effects of success with, with that. Or more houses. What's that? Or more houses. Yeah. <laughs>